and share it with others. So um, just so you know, we've, we've just started with the recording. So my name is Neb Zachariah and I am a health promotion research analyst at the region and I'm working with a community, community engagement working group. Um, and I've been joined by Meghna Patel. So Meghna is a um, pharmacist. She's working at the University of Waterloo Research Institute for Aging as a clinical pharmacist for Jerry Medrisk. So um, today we're gonna go through some information about the vaccines. So Meghna will, will start us off with some information about the vaccines. And then after that, I'll share some information just about um, the vaccine clinics and how you can actually go about getting vaccinated um, here in the Waterloo region. So. We will, I'm gonna turn it over to Magna and we'll start with just some vaccine information. Thanks now, I'm just gonna share my screen. Is everybody able to see that? Okay, okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks, Neb, for the introduction. And um, I'm just gonna um, first start off by uh, first and foremost, thanking Dr. Kelly Grimgrod, Neb, and Fazia for coordinating with me uh, for, for making this presentation possible today. Uh, all of the content that I'm going to be sharing with you today, as well as the slides that you see here are created by Dr. Kelly Grimgrod. And I'm gonna get started with the presentation. So uh, there are three objectives that I'm going to be talking about today. The first is to understand how mRNA and viral vaccines work. So there are two kinds of vaccines that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, secondly, to review the COVID-19 vaccines that are available on the market, as well as review the safety of these vaccines. So if we look at this slide, and uh, we have data of the population vaccinated across Canada. Uh, as we all know, the data is changing every day, but this is as of March 27, 2021. Almost 7 billion doses have been given in Canada. This could be the first dose, or it could be two doses that some people have already received. So essentially, 12% of Canadians have been vaccinated already. So if we look on the left, um, in BC, we have almost 1 million doses that have been administered. And as we go down the list, we can see in Ontario, we have almost uh, 3 million doses that have been ad administered. If you look towards the right of the slide, we see the percentage of people in specific provinces that have been vaccinated. So if you see in BC, we have 12%, in Alberta, we have 11%, Quebec, 14%, and so on. If you look up north in the Yukon Territory, we see over 50% of the population is vaccinated. And uh, same with the Northwest Territory and about a third of the population in Nunavut have been vaccinated. So what's interesting about this is that in those areas, we know that access to healthcare is a lot more difficult than it is in our provinces down here. So that's why a lot of the vaccines were first sent to those communities to get them vaccinated. And as we can see, the numbers of vaccinated people in our provinces below are now slowly increasing. Okay, so what are the vaccines? The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are messenger, which is mRNA vaccines. The mRNA vaccine is like the most wanted poster that tells your body how to recognize COVID-19. It can't and it won't change your DNA. It does not change your genetics. This is something that a lot of people ask, like, does this vaccine change my genetics? Does it change my DNA? And the answer is no, it does not. So the vaccine is not a full virus. It's just a tiny piece of the virus on the surface that shows your body what the virus may look like in the bigger picture. And then your body memorizes it and then knows how to fight COVID-19 if it sees it. If we look at this, uh, if we start on the left, the mRNA vaccine is injected. The mRNA cannot change your DNA, like I said earlier. The cells in your body then read the mRNA instructions and start building the same kind of spike proteins that COVID-19 has. Now, it's important for us to know that these spike proteins are harmless, okay? The mRNA then dissolves. The mRNA is not very strong. It only lasts long enough to make the spike proteins, and then it breaks apart and it goes away. So basically, it doesn't exist anymore. Your immune system sees the spike proteins and starts building a defense and launches an attack. Now, during this time, you may feel some fatigue, 
uh, that's tiredness, aches or pains, muscle aches or pains, or you may even have a fever at this point. But just remember that this is totally normal. It's your immune system that's learning to fight the COVID virus by learning how to recognize these spike proteins. The fever, aches, and pains is basically your body learning how to attack the, the virus. Lastly, now your body can recognize the COVID-19 spike protein, fight COVID-19 effectively, and you're immune. So like I mentioned earlier, there's two types of mRNA vaccines, your messenger RNA uh, vaccines. We have the Pfizer and we have the Moderna. Each need two doses at zero and 21 days and at zero and 28 days. But the government had decided that we're actually going to wait four months before giving the second dose. And you may ask, why is that? Well, the thing to know is that most vaccines are generally three to six months apart. It's not really normal for us to have two vaccines that are very close to each other. The reason why they initially chose the timeline of 21 days and 28 days was because they wanted the trials for the research to be done faster. In real life, what that means is that if we take the second dose and we delay it by four months, it would mean that 90% of Canadians could get their first dose by June if we wait. So there's a lot of conversation going on about waiting, and it appears to be safe. But don't be too surprised if things change by the time you get your first dose and they ask you to come back in two months, or they may ask you to come back in three months. But that's okay, because things are continuously changing as we move forward. As we can see on this table, Pfizer was also researched in people aged 16 years and older, and Moderna was also researched in people aged 18 years and older. You also may have seen in the news that Pfizer finished its trials for kids aged 12 to 16, and that means pretty soon, hopefully by June, we'll be able to see kids who are 12 years and older getting vaccinated as well. Moderna also announced that they were going to start a trial with babies aged six months and older up to 18 years old. And then once again, we are hoping that by summer, kids will also start getting vaccinated. But we just have to wait till the research is complete. We always start off researching in adults followed by children. Once we know that it is absolutely safe in adults, that's when we begin research in children. So how effective are the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines? Both vaccines are 95% effective against disease. So what that means is that for most people, about 95% of the population that gets vaccinated, if they were exposed, they wouldn't get sick. So let's take an example. If we're 20 people that get vaccinated, 19 people wouldn't get sick, they wouldn't have any form of symptoms. Maybe one out of the 20 might have a mild cold. So this tells us that the vaccines are very, very, very effective. And they work across all different uh, age groups. And what is, what is special about this vaccine is that it actually works really well in the older population. These vaccines work pretty well in the older population for which we have to be very happy and grateful about because COVID is really bad in the older population as we know. With regards to race and ethnicity, drugs generally don't work differently in different races and in different ethnicity groups. This means that these trials and these research studies were one of the first that had lots of different people from lots of different races and ethnicities. They were diverse trials, which we don't see often. And they also involved people from various different communities. This gives us a lot of confidence that these vaccines will work well for everyone across all groups. So after the research was done, we wanted to know how well it works in real life. Research is one thing, and that was fine. But what about real life? What about our life, like every day, day to day? So Israel is doing an amazing job with vaccinating people. They're vaccinating so many people that they regard it as one of the best vaccinating countries in the world right now. This means that they are two or three months ahead of us in the vaccinating schedule. 
which means that we are able to learn from them, right? That's an advantage to us because we can see how the vaccine is actually working in the real life or in real world life. So the research in Israel showed that the vaccines work across age groups, including people older than 70 years old. Also, they found that two to three weeks after they got the vaccine, about half of the people were protected. They tested positive, but they had no symptoms, which means they were, which means they had an asymptomatic infection. About the other half of the people tested positive, but they did have the symptoms. Most importantly with COVID, putting people in the hospital and causing severe symptoms and killing people, the vaccine is actually preventing people from going to the hospital and protecting people from severe illness and keeping them alive. Even at two to three weeks, we can see here, the vaccine is extremely effective. At weeks three to four, people are getting even more protected. After three to four weeks of getting the vaccine, about 80% of the people, if they were exposed to COVID, will not go to the hospital, will not get severely sick, and will not die. And after you get the second dose of all those, after you get the second dose, all of those numbers actually go up to about 90%. So we can see from these the statistics that the vaccine is very, very effective at preventing hospitalization, preventing severe illness, and preventing people from dying. So what about allergies? This is something that we heard on in the earlier stages of um, vaccine administration, that people were having allergic reactions to the vaccine. Allergic reactions happen with any drug. It can happen with any vaccine. People always have allergic reactions, and that's normal. However, what's reassuring for us to know is that everyone that administers these vaccines is trained on how to manage a bad allergy called anaphylaxis. That's usually when your lips swell up and you have shortness of breath. But don't worry, because people that are administering, administering the vaccine, they know what to do. We give you epinephrine, we call the hospital, and you're monitored. With this vaccine, that has happened just like any other vaccine. We have seen people have allergic reactions, but in all cases, everyone has been okay because once again, we know how to manage these bad allergies. They do happen, but they're extremely, extremely rare. For statistics, if you wanna know, for every 1 million people that are vaccinated, maybe only about five people have the bad allergy. It is very, very unlikely. What we do is when you come into the vaccine clinic, the first thing we ask you is that if you've had an allergy to anything in the past, do you have an allergy to any of the ingredients in the vaccine? Do you have an allergy to cats, dogs, maybe pollen, drugs, anything? If you say yes, we tell you to wait 30 minutes after getting the vaccine. For everybody else, they wait for 15 minutes to make sure that everything is okay. They are special waiting rooms after getting the vaccine. So let's switch to the other uh, vaccine type, which is the viral vector vaccines. That's your AstraZeneca and your Johnson & Johnson vaccines. So viral vector vaccines use a safe virus to carry some of the genes of SARS-CoV-2 to teach the body how to recognize it. So SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus itself that causes COVID-19. COVID is all the symptoms and the sickness that we feel from the virus. Just like the mRNA vaccines, the viral vector vaccines gives your body a piece, the spike protein, and your body learns to recognize it and protects you. So like the other one, like the mRNA vaccines, let's start at number one for the viral vector vaccines, which is our Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines. Scientists, scientists make harmless adenoviruses that deliver a short genetic code to your cells. Your body destroys the adenovirus after. The genetic code tells your cells to build the same kind of spike proteins that COVID-19 has. And once again, important to emphasize that this cannot change your DNA. 
So what is this adenovirus? Adenoviruses commonly cause colds and other mild symptoms. So we've all been exposed to an adenovirus before. We've all had a cold before, and that's exactly caused by the adenovirus. Your body then sees the new spike proteins and starts building a defense, and it launches an attack. As we know from the mRNA vaccines, when your body launches an attack, you may feel fatigued, you may feel tired, you may have aches and pains, you, may, you might even have a fever at this point. But just remember, it's your immune system that's learning how to attack one day when you're actually exposed to the virus. Your body can now recognize the COVID-19 spike protein and fight off COVID-19 effectively, and you're immune. So there's two kinds of viral vector vaccines that I mentioned. It's the AstraZeneca, which is a two-dose vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson, which is a one-dose vaccine. Both of these vaccines are studied for people over the age of 18, and AstraZeneca just up until yesterday was reserved for people over the age of 55 years old because of the very rare risk of blood clots, which I will talk about in a minute. But Health Canada has just issued a statement yesterday that the AstraZeneca virus, will, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine will now be used for all age groups above 18 years old. However, they will warn us about the risk of the blood clots that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. So now we ask the question, how effective are these vaccines? Both of them are very, very effective. 100% effective at protecting you from severe illness, hospitalization, and death. All four of the vaccines that we discuss now are very effective at protecting us from getting really sick, going to the hospital, or dying. What's special about these two vaccines, in addition to what they do, is that they also effective at protecting us from even mild symptoms. So 60 to 70 percent are protected against getting mild cold symptoms when they get this vaccine. So for every three people that get these vaccines, two people, if they were exposed to COVID, wouldn't even get the mild symptoms. But maybe one out of the three might have like a cold or a fever or slight fatigue. And also these vaccines appear to work across all age groups. So there's a study in Scotland on how effective is one dose in preventing hospitalization. Scotland is far ahead of Canada and the US in terms of vaccinating their population. So they looked at about 5 million people who got the first dose of the vaccine and they asked, well, did it protect against people having to go to the hospital? And what they found was that the best effect is about four weeks after the vaccine. And for the Pfizer vaccine, 85% of people were protected from going to the hospital just after one dose. And for the AstraZeneca vaccine, 94% of people were protected from going to the hospital after one dose. So the next question is, who cannot get the vaccine? So the good news about this is that pretty much everyone can get one of the two kinds of vaccines. If you have a confirmed allergy to an ingredient in one of the vaccines, you should not get that vaccine. So for example, the mRNA vaccine, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, have an ingredient called polyethylene glycol, which is PEG. And if you know that you have an allergy to this, then we would not give you this vaccine. But you could certainly get the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because they don't have PEG in them. It is very unusual and rare for people to be allergic to PEG. PEG is in a lot of things. For example, it's in our Advil over-the-counter medications. It's in Benadryl. It's in a lot of our tablets that, that is generally manufactured for chronic diseases as well. Also, if you were given your first dose, and if you had an allergy to it at that time, then we would say, don't get a second dose. But that would have to be a severe allergy. And we would make sure that you talk to your doctor, you tell your doctor what had happened or your pharmacist, and they would help you decide on whether you would need to get your second dose or not. Another situation would be is if you have COVID now or you feel like you may have COVID and you're getting a test and you're waiting for your results. We would just wait until you're feeling better 
Because if your body is already fighting something, we don't want to give your body the vaccine at the same time. We want to wait because we want your body to be absolutely ready for the vaccine so it can learn from the vaccine and it can be effective. So if you test positive for COVID today, we may wait one or two weeks before you get the vaccine. Also, if you're sick in any way, such as if you have a urinary tract infection or you're taking antibiotics or if you have a fever, we'll say wait. Wait for one or two weeks for the vaccine so that your immune system is absolutely ready for the vaccine. Also, if you've received another vaccine in the last 14 days or the last two weeks, such as the flu vaccine, we wait for two weeks once again. After that, we will then give you the COVID vaccine just to make sure it is effective. Now let's talk about the side effects. This is a very common question that we get from everybody. And this is something that everybody's afraid of and that's why they don't wanna get the vaccine. So this is something that will help you understand better on what the side effects are. Eight in 10 people complain of a sore arm, but only one in a hundred people say that it is severe pain. And just for you to note that after the second dose, the arm might hurt a little more than the first dose, but this is normal and this is absolutely common. So usually when you get the vaccine, they would ask you like, which arm would you like to get the vaccine in? If you're right-handed, then you should ask them to give it to you in your left hand. And if you're left-handed, then you would say, give me the vaccine in the right hand. And if you have a sore arm after, it's okay for you to take Tylenol or Advil just so that it will help you with the pain. Five in 10 people, so about half the people that get the vaccine, complain of feeling tired and having a headache. But only one in 10 people need to take Tylenol or Advil for this. So it's normal to feel tired for a day or two after taking the vaccine. The side effects are stronger after the second dose, and they're also stronger if you're younger. Older people tend to have very few side effects. The side effects are the result of an, of an expected immune response to the vaccine, and the majority are mild and easily manageable at home. I'm sure that we all have been hearing about this in the news and from our friends. What about the blood clots? This is a very big, big question. So there are four main things that you need to know about the blood clots with COVID and the COVID vaccines. So if you look here, in Canadians, without COVID or without the vaccine, for every thousand people, okay, every thousand people, one or two people are affected with blood clots. This is common and it happens all the time. So with COVID, what makes it so dangerous and what causes so many people to go to the hospital in ICU is that for every 20 people that have COVID and go to the hospital, one person would develop a blood clot. COVID itself causes blood clots. Some data also show that one in five Canadians who are hospitalized with COVID have a blood clot. Blood clots is the biggest problem with managing COVID. So for people that do get COVID and are able to recover at home, meaning they're just resting at home and they're getting better, they don't go to the hospital, one in a hundred of these people get blood clots. So with the AstraZeneca vaccine, for some reason, there has been one very, very rare reaction where the vaccine is causing blood clots in the body. But the good news is that we know how to manage it. At that time, sure, it was a surprise for us. It was something that we didn't expect. Like all around the world, there are tracking systems in place once people receive these vaccines. And there's continuous monitoring parameters, monitoring systems that pick up like if something is going wrong with the vaccine. So that's exactly what had happened in Germany and Denmark. They noticed that a few people getting the vaccine had blood clots. And they wondered if the vaccine was actually causing these blood clots. And they did eventually figure out that it was the vaccine that was causing it, but the numbers were so low. If we look at the bottom, it, sh it shows us that one in the 250,000 people have had this rare reaction when they took the AstraZeneca vaccine. Let's not forget 
that one out of 100 people with COVID have a blood clot and one out of 20 people with COVID in hospital have a blood clot. So if we look at the one in 250,000 with the AstraZeneca vaccine, that's very low. So across the board of specialists, it was decided that the vaccine is much safer than getting COVID and it is very effective in protecting you from getting COVID. They also noticed that the blood clot from the vaccine happened more commonly in the young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and more so in females. And that's the reason why, just up until yesterday, like I mentioned, Canada had decided to reserve the AstraZeneca vaccine for people over the age of 55. But as we're collecting more data and as we're understanding this blood clots better, Health Canada has made the decision that they're no longer going to be restricting it for uh, people above, uh, for people uh, below the age of 55. They're going to be administering it to everybody above the age of 18. So as your immune system learns from the COVID vaccine, you may have some fatigue, feeling tired, headache, achy muscles, chills, and a low fever. Feeling slightly bad for a short time as you build immunity for a long time. When I got my vaccine last week, I also had a sore arm for two days and I felt really tired for a day. But after that, I was completely fine. So, I mean, if you have a sore arm, if you have a little bit of a headache, a mild fever, Tylenol is not a bad idea. Just take Tylenol for a day or two and you're bound to feel better. So let's go through a few questions and answers with regards to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Uh, these are a few common questions. So how were these vaccines developed so fast? So we've only known vaccines to take so long to develop. We do know that a lot of time is wasted in between. Once you have an idea for something, you, you propose it, you um, request funds from the government or global funding to kind of develop the product, and then you test it on a small group of people. Then again, you request funding, and then you test it on a larger group of people. So what had happened with COVID is that the global funding was more than enough to develop these vaccines. It was, it was so demanding at that time to develop a vaccine that that it was very quick, like everything just happened much faster than we anticipated. mRNA vaccines itself are also much faster to make than traditional vaccines. mRNA vaccines can't change my DNA, right? Like I mentioned before, that's absolutely correct. The mRNA vaccine will not change your DNA. Are the ingredients in the mRNA vaccine safe? Yes. The ingredients in the mRNA vaccines are absolutely safe. It just has a fatty layer in which the mRNA sits in, so it's easier to be transmitted into our body. It's preservative-free, and like I mentioned, it has the polyethylene glycol, so if you're allergic to that, that's something that you would be concerned about, and basically has salt, sugar, and water. That's it. Very important to note is that there are no animal products in these vaccines, as well as there are no fetal cells. So no pork, no animal products, no fetal cells, preservative free, just salt, sugar, and water. So what kind of long-term data do we still need? So this is the burning question, because right now we know that the vaccine works, we, and most people have only gotten their first vaccine, or some people their second dose. We don't know how long this vaccine is actually going to protect us against this virus. So as research goes on, as more people in the population are vaccinated, will we understand how long we are going to be protected for? We might need to get the vaccine again again after a year, we might need to get it after five years, or maybe even after six months. We're not sure. So we're waiting for that data to come up. While I was talking about this question, while I'm talking about these questions, I also want to touch on the safety of these vaccines in pregnancy. These vaccines appear to be very, very safe in pregnancy. And there are many people across the world that are taking these vaccines at different times of their pregnancy. And the continuous monitoring system and tracking system is looking out for rare reactions that are happening. And so far, we found nothing. Pregnant women and women that are breastfeeding as well, the vaccine has been absolutely safe. In fact, recently, there's been some research that has come out 
that a vaccinated pregnant woman that gives birth to her baby, the baby is also born with protection against COVID. This protection has been passed on from the mother to the babies. Likewise, for breastfeeding women, the babies are becoming immune as well because of the immunity that's passed on from the mother to the baby. So what we do is when you come into the vaccine clinic, they will generally ask you if you're pregnant. And if you say, yes, you are, then they'll ask you if you discussed this with your doctor. Have you discussed taking this vaccine with your doctor? And if you have, and if you're comfortable, they'll be more than happy to give you the vaccine. But and if you haven't spoken to a doctor, that's also okay, because there are doctors that are available at the clinic that will be more than happy to speak to you and discuss the risks and benefits. And ultimately, you can decide with your healthcare professional whether you'd like to proceed or not. Likewise, let's go through a few questions and answers with regards to the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. Most of it, I've already talked about them. Like it's, it's using a safe virus as a carrier and that's how it works in our body. They are very effective against severe illness, hospitalization and death. The ingredients are also very, very safe. There's no animal products, no blood products, no fetal tissue. Just like the other vaccines, we're waiting for long-term data to see how long the vaccine works for. And if we need to take the vaccine again to protect ourselves against COVID, we don't know what the timelines are. Maybe after six months, five years, one year, 10 years, we're not sure. We're also waiting to see how well these vaccines will work for the different variants of COVID-19. All of these vaccines seem to be working for the British variant that we have in Ontario. There's some questions now on whether it will work against the Brazilian variant in BC. We know that the AstraZeneca vaccine doesn't work very well against the South African variant, but we're not really dealing with that now here in Canada. So when we talk about building confidence in the vaccine, it is normal if you have concerns. It is normal if you come across people in your life that say they're fine, they believe they won't get COVID. And it isn't because they're ignorant or because they don't understand. It's just that they have concerns and that's normal. What we need to consider though, is that there are people who accept the vaccine at the first shot. When you offer it to them, they're happy to take it. Then you have people who have questions and then people who are just a little bit nervous about taking the vaccine. Sometimes we just need to give people a little bit of time before they are willing to accept the vaccine and that's normal. Some people are super excited when they come to get their vaccine. Perhaps they may have lost a loved one to COVID, or they may be even working in a workplace where people have COVID. On the other hand, there are some people that come to get the vaccine, but they're just so scared because they're not sure about the safety of the vaccine. All of these, all of these scenarios are common. Some of the big questions are, does it work? As we talked about it today, yes, they are very effective at protecting us against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. People want to know, is the vaccine safe? As we said earlier, the vaccines are absolutely safe. They might have some mild side effects, like a sore arm, you might feel tired, you might get a headache, a few muscle aches and pains, which all go away within a day or two and is normal. Very, very rarely, there's a side effect like the blood clots that we spoke about with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we know how to deal with that side effect. And just remembering that it's extremely rare and COVID by itself causes a lot of blood clots. COVID is very dangerous when it comes to blood clots. So the vaccine is much safer than having COVID. And people also think that they are not at risk. There has been so many cases where people come into the hospital with COVID and they say, I cannot believe I got the virus. I was not affected by it by the, in this past year. The thing is that these variants are so contagious and people are getting the virus at places that they least expect to be exposed to the virus, like the grocery store. Or even if you're meeting up with your friends and family outdoors and you're sitting close to one another, this shows us that the risk of getting the virus has gone up. And that's why we keep emphasizing and keep telling everyone, get the vaccine as soon as possible so that you can protect yourself. On the other hand of this, these vaccines, these vaccines work and they are safe. 
there's a high risk for every one of us getting COVID now in the third wave. So if you get the vaccine, it will protect you and it will protect everyone around you, such as your family. So this is the way to get out of this pandemic. So in Canada, what we saw was that last summer in July, only 46% of Canadians said that if you offer me a vaccine today, I will be willing to take it. So that's about half the population. In September, in the fall, only about 39% would have agreed to take the vaccine. Then in November, we started hearing about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. And in December, we actually started receiving these vaccines in the country and people started getting the vaccine. And when some people saw that other people were getting the vaccine, they said, hang on a minute, I can also get the vaccine. And by January, 60% of Canadians said that they would get the vaccine. So if you got the vaccine, be proud. Go and tell your friends and family and everyone around you. People are more likely to get the vaccine if their healthcare provider got it. They are also more likely to get the vaccine if people from their church or temple or religious, uh, like religious place is getting the vaccine. People are more likely to get the vaccine if their friends and family are getting it. So go out and spread the word. Just to end off, this is a very busy table, but I just wanted to show you that these are all of the vaccines that are being researched and used around the world. We spoke of the mRNA vaccines, which are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. We spoke of the viral vector vaccines, which are the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines. There's a newer vaccine called the Novavax, which is a different kind of vaccine, which they are looking to make in Montreal. Then there's vaccines in Germany, Russia, there's two vaccines in China. There's a lot of research going on around the world and there's a lot of work that's being done. So uh, that's the end of the presentation and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you can put it in the chat box and uh, we'll try and get to all the questions. And if we don't have an answer to the question, then we'll certainly get back to you. We'll take your details. Nav will help me with this and we'll take your details and we'll get the answer sent to you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Magna. Um, and as Magna mentioned, we, you can um, submit your questions in the chat box. You should see that along the bottom of your screen. Um, or in just a moment, we'll, we'll um, give some time for you. You can unmute and you can ask your questions directly to Magna. But before we do that, I'm just going to share um, some information about vaccine distribution in Waterloo Region. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So right now in Waterloo region, there are, um, we are in phase two of vaccine distribution. So these are the groups that, can, that are eligible to pre-register for the vaccine. So right now, adults um, who are residing in chronic or who are have chronic home care needs are eligible to be vaccinated. Um, adults who are over the age of 60, so those who are born um, 1961 or earlier. And then in specific high priority neighborhoods, adults who are over the age of 50 are eligible to be vaccinated as well. So um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means and what neighborhoods those are in just a minute. Um, but the other groups that are included in pre-registration at this point are healthcare workers. So um, any category of healthcare worker are eligible, um, indigenous adults, long-term care and retirement home, staff, essential care givers, as well as residents, um, and then adults who are high risk or highest risk health conditions. So you likely will have been contacted by your healthcare professional, by your doctor, if you fall into this category. Um, and there are more details about what in those exact conditions are on the region's website, um, but high risk and highest risk, as well as um, one caregiver for those categories are eligible to pre-register right now in the region. Right now, we have vaccination clinics at a number of sites, and these, this is being updated all the time. I believe that there's a few more already um, that are open and not on this list. So there are quite a few sites that you can select from when you do pre-register for the vaccine or when you do book your vaccine appointment. Um, and so they're distributed throughout Waterloo Region. If you are in one of those eligible 
um, groups, you can pre-register on the region's website, as I mentioned. And so you can go to the website and on the website, you will see um, a, a button that you can press to pre-register for the vaccine. And there's also information or a video that you can watch that will help you give you step-by-step -step instructions on how you can pre-register for the vaccine. If English is not your second language or is not your first language or not your preferred language, you can translate the resources on the website. So there is a translate option here. You would just click the plus button beside the search bar. Um, and from there, you can um, select the language that you prefer to read your um, information in. And you can get all of the website information translated. We also have a number of resources that are available um, in a number of languages that I will explain in a little bit. So I just wanna mention that when you pre-register to go to one of those existing sites that I shared earlier, it does not mean that you have an appointment booked already or that you will be contacted immediately. So when you pre-register, you enter how you would like the region to get in touch with you to book your appointment. So that could be by email, could be by text message, or it could be by phone. Typically, um, the response time for text message and email um, contacts is a little bit faster. So we recommend if you do have a way of um, getting an email or a text message response, then that would probably be the best way to do it if you wanted to hear back a little bit faster. Um, or you could ask someone um, to help you with that if, if you're not able to do that on your own, um, but would like to hear back a little bit faster, um, you should use the email or text message response. So I did mention that we have a few high priority neighborhoods in the Waterloo region. Um, and so these are the neighborhoods that I'm referring to. So that includes Vanier Rockaway, Country Hills, Alpine Laurentian, Victoria Hills, Cherry Hills neighborhood, as well as Shades Mills. And so these are neighborhoods that have been um, impacted at a higher rate um, by COVID-19 cases. And so we are really prioritizing getting vaccinations uh, and getting people into um, the vaccination clinics in these neighborhoods. So um, again, if you are in these neighborhoods, you are eligible to be vaccinated if you are 50 plus. And you could go to any of the existing clinics and you would pre-register using the, the methods that I did mention earlier. We do have mobile clinics coming uh, later this month. And so those are going to be in, uh, in these neighborhoods. Um, and so those details are not confirmed yet, but if you are interested in booking an appointment at one of those mobile clinics, I would recommend that you speak with your settlement worker or caseworker, and they'll be able to help you get an appointment for the mobile clinic. So that, that booking process is a little bit different than it is for the existing clinics. Um, and so you, I would suggest you talk to your, your worker if these are the clinics that you're interested in booking. So regardless of where you are being vaccinated, um, there are a few things that are consistent across the board. So um, when you are getting your vaccination, it is important that you bring your identification. That's important to make sure that um, the region knows who has been vaccinated and we can keep track of everyone who's received their vaccine and so that we can keep track of everyone, um, the dates and times so that we can make sure that you're receiving your second vaccination in the timeframe that is appropriate. Um, it's best not to arrive more than 10 minutes before your appointment. We want to make sure that we have space for everyone who is scheduled for their appointment and we want to avoid crowds and ensure that the appropriate distancing is being maintained. So no more than about 10 minutes before your appointment to arrive. And if you need someone to, to come with you to, to help translate or to help support you move through that process, that vaccination process, you can bring one person with you. Um, and they can, they can come into your appointment with you. At the clinics or when you're being vaccinated, wear something that you can easily just pull down and expose your shoulders so that you can get your vaccination. It will be in your, your upper shoulder. So a t-shirt or a top that you can just slide down easily is probably the best way, best, best thing to wear to those appointments to make sure that you can, um, the nurses can or the vaccinators can easily access um, your shoulder. After your appointment, there are a few things to keep in mind. So as Magna mentioned, um, allergic reactions are very rare, but clinic staff will ask you to stay and wait for about 15 minutes in general um, if you don't have any allergies and 30 minutes if you have um, expressed that you have allergies to, to anything. That's just to keep an eye on you to make sure that there's, there are no allergic reactions um, that they need to respond to. 
but after that, um, they will let you go and give you information about your second appointment or about booking your second appointment. And it's important to remember that although we have we see great um, effect of the, the of the vaccines after the first dose, it's important to continue to follow healthcare measures even after you receive that first dose until the majority of people um, have received or are fully vaccinated. So continue to wash your hands, continue to wear a mask continue to socially distance two meters apart, continue to um, keep your contacts to those who are within your household and avoid crowds as much as possible. So I know that it is a lot of information that we've given you today. Um, and I'm sure that there's um, there might be others in your community or in your family that you think would benefit from some of this information. So um, I just wanted to point out that we do have a number of resources on the region's website. So if, if you can, um, it might be great to copy this link or to take a picture of this slide maybe even, um, or I can share it in the chat afterwards. We have a number of resources on this website. So we have videos with healthcare professionals, just explaining the benefits of the vaccine, why they've taken the vaccine, um, decision to take a vaccine um, during a pregnancy, that sort of thing. We also have fact sheets that you can access on this site, and those are available in a number of different languages, information about aftercare, what to do after you get the vaccine, um, to make sure that you're make sure that the side effects are not impacting you. So things like taking um, Advil, that sort of thing. Um, and all of that is available in a number of different languages. So um, that would be a really great place to get that some information about that. And then we also have um, some more general information about the vaccine, information about vaccine rollout. So You'll, you will also be able to find information about eligibility. So I mentioned that there are two categories of high risk and highest risk health conditions. All of those details are also available on the region's website and that gets updated on a regular basis. As we move through the vaccination process, we'll have different groups that are eligible to be vaccinated. So all of those updates can be found on this website. Um, and as I mentioned, we have frequently asked questions and translated resources and tools available for you to access. We also have sessions like this um, that have been recorded and delivered in um, a number of different languages. So um, you can also see see if there are other resources that might be helpful to you or your family or friends who have questions about the vaccine. So that's it for me. I just wanted to share some of that quick vaccine information with you. Um, at this time, I'm going, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we, I see that we have a few comments here. So we may have a few questions. And then if you'd like to, you can also unmute and ask questions. So I will, Magda, do you see that question there? Or do you want me to read it yes. out to you? No, I, I got it, Neb. Okay, uh, right. So the question says, hi, Megna, I'm from Kitchener. I just wanted to find out if a patient has a cardiovascular condition or any uh, vascular condition that causes an increased risk of blood clots and they are still advised to take the vaccine. Has prophylaxis therapy for blood clot ever been considered before high-risk patients for occurrence of blood clots take the vaccine? So basically, if we look at the list of contraindications that have been listed in terms of the research studies and the trials that have been done, cardiovascular conditions or pre-existing cardiovascular conditions have not been listed as a contraindication. So it is safe for you to take the vaccine. You may have to have this discussion with your primary care provider or your, your regular doctor that you go to before you get the vaccine, and they will discuss the risks and benefits uh, for taking this vaccine with you. If need be, the doctor may put you on a prophylaxis like aspirin or something before you get the vaccine, but that's something that you do not do by yourself. You absolutely have the discussion with your primary care provider, with your doctor before you get the vaccine. And that's a good question because a lot of us have medical conditions, chronic medical conditions, and we have doubts on whether this vaccine is going to affect the way our medications work or whether it's going to affect the chronic condition itself. So very good question. Just ask your healthcare provider on what the best would be for you and then take it from there. But listed from the manufacturer itself, it's not a contraindication. Thanks, Sam. And Lizette, I see that you have a question. You can unmute and ask your question. My name is Lucy. Oh, we're having trouble hearing you. You might need to move a little closer to your mic. Oh, 
Well, we're not hearing you. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you. Are you able to, to type it into the chat at all? So uh, basically, if you do, okay, so the question is, if the client has COVID-19, they are asking me if they should get vaccinated. So basically, the answer is no, you will not get vaccinated while you have the COVID-19 uh, COVID infection. We will wait for approximately two weeks. Or the best thing to do in this case as well is to communicate that with your primary care provider, your doctor, and let your doctor know that this is the case. And usually in an infection, in the period that you have an infection, we don't give you the vaccine because that just... It, increases the load that your immune system has to deal with at that point. So we wait for you to get better. And absolutely after two weeks, after two to three weeks of recovery, that's when you would get the COVID um, vaccine at that point. But likewise, just have that conversation with your doctor. And after that, um, you can take it from there. Great. We have a few minutes. I don't know if there is if there are any other questions. Oh, I'm hearing some typing, we'll wait a minute. Yes, we are offering more sessions. So we have this, another session tomorrow um, that will be another information session just like this being offered tomorrow. If you would like me to send information about that, um, session, please send your email to me in the chat. So in the chat, you can select who you, who you are sending the message to. Send your email to me. I will send you um, information to access that session. We also have another session scheduled for Monday um, and then a session scheduled for Monday the 26th. So um, please put your information into the chat and I can get you um, those session details. So we have another question. Are there, any, um, are there any data that suggests that patients who have had COVID-19 actually have antibodies in their blood and don't need the vaccine? So the truth is that after you do have COVID-19, you are protected to a certain extent. You do have antibodies in your blood, but it's not good enough or it's not it's not 100% assurance that if you do become exposed to the virus again, because there's so many different variants as well in within the virus. So we still encourage that you get the vaccine after you've had COVID-19 for extra protection, um, even after you've been, even if you've had the infection before, basically. Uh, Lisette, your question about languages, we, the session on Monday will be offered in Arabic. If there's another language that you know that um, would be, be beneficial, um, please share that with us and we can see what we can do about, about arranging a session. Spanish, okay. But I will, um, Lisette, please put your um, contact information in the chat and I'll see if we can arrange something and I'll, I'll make sure to contact you once we do have that. Wonderful. Thank you all. And thank you so much, Magna, for your time and sharing all of that information. That's great. Um, take care, everyone. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye.